everyone. This is the video that goes with chapter three, the chapter on evaluating research and assessment. Um, talks a little bit about the ethics and um, some of the issues that come up in, in psychological research having to do with personality. Um, just before we go into that, though, um, I want to recap a couple of things. Um, one, I want to uh, make sure that everybody knows that there's a Q&A discussion forum out there. Um, and anytime you have a question that you think might be of interest to everyone, feel free to post out there. Um, if you see a post there and you want to answer it because you know the answer and you can beat me to it, please do. Um, and then I'll try and monitor that every week so that um, I can um, keep up with the questions um, and answer them for the benefit of everybody. Occasionally, I'll post in there myself um, if I have a question that's come up frequently um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm worried that people aren't seeing it someplace else. Um, I may have said this before, but in the questions um, that you post to me in your icebreaker emails, um, about a third of them had to do with personality and the psychology of personality. About a third had to do with general psychology and human development. Um, and about a third had to do with disorders. Um, and I just want to um, sort of highlight for you um, that this course is not primarily about disorders, that we're really talking about how personality develops and the different theories of personality um, in the more typical developing sense so that we can understand when things are sort of outside of that range. So um, when it comes time to write your paper, um, it will be somebody who, it'll be about somebody or you'll analyze the personality of somebody um, who is not known for a personality disorder. It doesn't mean that you don't think that there are some things that they can improve on, um, but uh, but it's not, um, th this is not a case study of a serial killer. Um, there are very few of those in life, thank goodness, um, but there are a lot of people and every person has a personality. So um, I want to um, encourage you um, to see these personality theories in your day-to-day -day life. Um, um, the week two assignments, um, you took an assessment last week um, called Personal Attitudes and Traits. Um, and a lot of times we will um, use a name that is, it's not meant to be deceptive, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what that measure is about because we don't want you to know what the measure is about until after you've taken it. And so for that one, Personal Attitudes and Traits is really called the Crown Marlowe um, Social Desirability um, Questionnaire. And what that is measuring is, um, you know how sometimes where um, you say, well, this was all self-report data, how much can we rely on self-report because people might be trying to paint themselves in an unrealistically positive or negative light. Um, and, and people do actually try to, uh, to appear more negative in some, in some instances. Um, and so the Crown Marlowe scale is intended to help researchers understand the extent to which an individual is doing that. So if you answer the question, you know, before I vote, I thoroughly investigate and research all the candidates. If you answer true to that, um, is that really true? Could that really be true? All the candidates, every time, um, you know, I always obey the law. It's like, okay, um, there's a law that says in my neighborhood, the speed limit is 25. If I'm going 26, I have technically broken the law. Um, and so we have to think about like, you know, have I committed a felony? No, but have I, um, have I broken the law? Sure, I've broken the law probably every week of my adult life in some way or another, whether I intended to or not, usually because I did not intend to. Um, in the Interruption Olympics video, um, a, a lot of you said that it was subjective. It was sort of 50-50 between subjective and objective. Um, just keep in mind that it can be really hard to, um, to define some of the operational variables. So um, what is it that constitutes an interruption? Is it after a pause? Um, when somebody breaks in, do they have to speak over the person? Um, and, and the way that you divide that up could be different from person to person. And so that's going to introduce some um, error of measurement in your data. So, um, so there, there usually is a little bit of difference. Um, and if you're doing a large study, that could mean a lot. So um, it's just something that the researchers like to get a handle on. Um, okay, um, and also last thing about um, prior weeks, um, in the discussion forums every week, I try to um, sort of put in as, a, as one of the options, or you can talk about anything else. Um, and so please keep in mind that the discussion prompts are my way of getting a discussion going. Um, but if you uh, have seen something in the news and it relates to something that we're studying that week, please use that, please introduce that in. Um, I think it should be a conversation the same way you would have a conversation in a college classroom. Um, and so I encourage you to um, talk about the things that are of interest to you um, that are happening around you. Okay, um, this chapter talks about psychometrics, talks about uh, research design, um, how to evaluate research 
research findings um, and ethical issues. It might not be the most interesting chapter of the whole book, um, but it's one that we sort of need to use to have a, a baseline for our class. Um, so reliability, validity, and generalizability. Um, a, a measure is reliable. So when you think about the Crown Marlowe measure or some of the measures that you're taking this week, um, it's reliable if uh, you take it this week and you take it next week and you take it a month from now, you get relatively the same answer. It might not be identical. One day you might be a little bit tired. One day you might be in a really good mood compared to others. Um, but you get generally the same answer each time. Test, retest, um, reliability um, is, is one of the ways that we measure reliability. So a test can be reliable without being valid though. Validity is, is it measuring what we think it's measuring? So if I think I'm measuring your personality, if I think I'm measuring social desirability, am I really measuring it? So it needs to be reliable uh, for it to be a valid measure, but it also needs to be measuring the thing that we think it's measuring. And one way that you can look at um, validity is to um, say, okay, we've got this test that has to do with social desirability. We also have another test and perhaps we have some, um, some informer report data or we have other ways of collecting data. Um, and by doing that, we can converge on the idea that it is a valid measure of that. And then we can start to use that measure. Um, and you'll see publications in scholarly journals where they have validated um, a measure and it's often with um, personality measures. Um, I would not use a personality measure unless I had seen a peer-reviewed scholarly research article um, in research, uh, a peer-reviewed scholarly research article that demonstrated that it was both reliable and valid and uh, widely accepted in the field because I don't want to use a measure that's a junk measure. I don't, you know, no disrespect to social media, um, but there are a lot of junk measures of, of personality out there and I want to make sure I have one that is, um, that's good science. Um, and then the last thing is uh, generalizability. Does it generalize, right? So it's a valid measure, but what difference does it make if I can't generalize it to some population of people? Um, so um, I want to know that if I'm testing something um, that, that not only is my finding important, um, but it generalizes to people within a particular population or subpopulation. Um, uh, so there's that. Okay, then research methods. Um, it goes through, your book goes through, or the textbook author goes through um, a number of different designs. When you think about the case study method, um, that can be a really interesting thing to do. If you read a biography of somebody or a, or a, a novel um, that does that purports to be a case study, um, if you're doing an in-depth um, dive on one person as a case study, sometimes that's the only option we have, right? Sometimes it's what we call a natural experiment where something has happened to one person. And it's very interesting for purposes of science. We would never do that to somebody intentionally, um, but we can learn from them. Um, there's a story, not a story, there's a case um, of a woman um, whose name is Jeannie, or her pseudonym is Jeannie, um, who was raised in isolation for the first um, 10 to 12 years of her life. We would never do that experiment as an experiment, but we can learn things from her uh, you know, from her life, from uh, interviews with the people around her, from videos of her, and so we, you know, that would be a case study and a, a somewhat of a what we would call a natural experiment, one that we wouldn't do. Um, when you think about um, the McAdams article from, that I assigned um, either last week or the week before um, as an optional reading that we're going to have as a required reading later in the semester, um, what do we know when we know a person? Um, and sort of, you know, what is it that, that we know about that person and how do we know it? And sometimes if we're talking just about one person, it would be a case study. Um, experimental design, you'd have a, a, a control group and a, um, and a research group, um, and then you would see what the, what the outcomes were. Um, experiments in psychology tend to be quasi-experimental um, because there are certain variables that we just can't assign you to. So uh, we can take people who were homeschooled and people who went to a traditional school and compare them, um, but we can't assign people um, earlier in their life. And it's like, you will be homeschooled for 12 years, um, K through 12, 13 years, <clears throat> and um, you will not be homeschooled. So if we want to look at those kinds of differences, um, sometimes we can ask people, were you or weren't you? And then we can compare those two groups, more of a correlational study than an experimental study. Um, but sometimes we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use a quasi-experiment. Um, even with the best of experimental methods or the best intent for experiments, and we can bring people into the lab and assign them to one condition or another. Um, but we also have to make sure that there's not an age-related difference or a gender difference or those kinds of things. And we can't randomly assign people to be a certain age or to have a particular gender 
or, or those kinds of things. And so, um, so in that sense, it's quasi-experimental rather than truly experimental. It doesn't mean that we don't, uh, that we don't uh, value the research. It just means that we need a lot of research and not just one study um, to tell us uh, what the answer is to any particular research question. Um, Correlation does not uh, equal causation. You've probably heard that many times. Um, pay attention uh, when you're looking at the stats portion of this chapter. Uh, I would say read all of it or skim all of it, but really it's only the correlations that I'm going to hold students in this course responsible for how to interpret those effect sizes. You know, a correlation of 0 0.03 versus 0 0.3 versus negative 0 0.03, negative 0.3. Um, so make sure that you understand the directionality of the um, of the correlation using the positive or negative sign, um, whether things are going up together or going down together, um, or whether uh, as one goes up, the other goes down, or as one goes down, the other goes up, um, or in some cases, no correlation. So I think there's a really good visual. I put a copy of it in the slides. It's also in the book. Um, of if you were plotting the data, what it would look like, um, and you would start to see a trend or not, um, and that would tell you something about um, about the strength of the correlation. Um, the, the easier it is to see that trend when the dots are really close together and they're all going in the same direction, that's a strong correlation. If it's a little fuzzier, it might be a, a, moder a correlation of moderate strength. Um, and if they're all over the map, it just means that those two things are not related. Um, and knowing the value of one doesn't really tell you very much about the value of the other one. Um, significance testing, you know, I think, uh, and effect sizes, um, just sort of skim through that. I'm not, this is not a stats course, and so I'm not going to hold you responsible for those things. Um, we do use replication a lot in, uh, in personality research and in psychology research in general, um, because one study doesn't prove anything. But um, if there are a number of studies that all converge on the same answer, um, then we can be pretty confident that that is the answer, at least until the next study uh, where you, you know, perhaps would uh, modify it. You know, at the end of every study, there's always um, a, a caveat that says, you know, for further research, here are some limitations. Here's what we don't know about the thing. Um, and for further research, perhaps we should do these things. And that further research might take you in a different direction. And that's the beauty of the scientific method. That's how we're learning all of what we're learning um, in psychology and in other science fields as well. Um, representation. Um, I think it's probably no surprise to you that um, much psychological research in the past has been done with convenience samples. So um, it tended to be people who lived within shouting distance of a major university, uh, people who had the time and inclination to participate in research, um, and that left out a lot of people. That left out people who worked hourly jobs, who uh, lived in a rural community and weren't close to, uh, to a research area um, so or a research institution. Um, so keep that in mind when you look at particularly the older research, more current research, is really challenging researchers to say, if you don't have a diverse sample, why don't you? Um, and and you know, go do it. By the way, um, and so uh, there's a there's a book. Um, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, there's a book um, that I've read a couple of times. I read it first in graduate school called um, Even the Rat Was White, A Historical View of Psychology. And it really goes through um, some of the limitations um, of the history of psychology um, in, you know, we were just studying, you know, sort of generally white middle class uh, populations that live near a university. And uh, so we have to think about what we know in psychology and how we build on that um, and how we improve that research by, um, by looking at more diverse samples and, uh, and you know, doing better research. Um, this week you're going to, this, this is my wrap up, um, this week you'll take a number of psychological tests. Um, I hope that you'll enjoy them. I hope that you'll find them interesting um, this week and throughout the rest of the semester. Whenever I can, um, I ask you to, if you're reading about a, a particular method or measure or theory, um, to also have some sort of an assessment so that you can make it personal to you, so that you can understand what you think about it, um, because you'll understand what your test results were um, and whether or not that seems consistent with what you would have expected. So um, this week there's an implicit association test um, through Project Implicit. Um, you may have already taken one of those um, in the past. Um, if you have, you know, I would encourage you to pick a different topic, um, but there are different sorts of implicit associations that you might test yourself on. There's a job application test and then the thematic apperception test um, where you uh, have to interpret something. So projective tests um, uh, are interesting um, and allow us to learn some things, but what we learn um, is subject to interpretation. So uh, I hope you'll find those interesting. Um, have a great week. As always, let me know if I can help you with anything. Um, and uh, keep on keeping on. Thanks. Bye.